um, do-it-yourself aerial mapping part two. Um, thank you for those of you who endured the rain during the first part of the aerial mapping. Uh, my name is Cindy and I'm a community organizer for Public Laboratory for Open Technology and Science and it's a great pleasure to be here and have been invited to be part of this festival. Hopefully we can share some information that is useful for you. So what I'm going to share with you is one of the public lab tools, which is mapping using kites. In the morning, like I said, we did, we tried anyway, to do a little bit of mapping. There wasn't enough wind. But um, this second part of the workshop is dedicated to actually playing with the data. So we did have a backup plan, and we have some uh, photos from when we went mapping yesterday that we're going to use uh, in one of the tools. But we'll get to that. So um, the space that is cleared on the ground here is for you to come and sit down on the floor. We actually got someone to sweep the floor, so it's clean, don't worry. And uh, we have some pictures printed out in color, and we're going to stitch a map together. But if you don't want to do paper-based mapping, then we're going to use the public lab tool online called Map Knitter. But first things first, so um, let's talk about public lab. And the best way to talk about public lab is to let public lab talk. So I don't know if I, how can, how can I get good sound? Is there a way to get the sound? Maybe this? Okay. So, oh, okay. So I'm going to show you um, a short video um, that was made for the Kickstarter campaign with the BP oil spill. So this is how Public Lab started. A group of people got together that lived in Louisiana, um, in the area where uh, the BP oil spill affected the wetlands and the fisheries around there. And this was a call for people to come out and help, to come and volunteer, to get data, to get the damage of the spill on the map, literally, because nobody, um, well, it was being left out of the media, it was being left out of um, stories uh, in general. So this is um, an effort and this is the video. There's increasingly kind of a media blackout of the spill. It's tough to actually see what's going on. The message here is that anyone can get out on the beaches and to areas that have been affected and, and map the oil spill. Yeah, see? Like if, if you just hold it from here, then it tends to hold a shape better. The idea is to get a lot of people involved in producing maps and then to share all the information, like Wikipedia style, you know? All you need is a kite or a balloon. You need a, a camera, a lot of string, have the camera taking pictures every five seconds. The data we're gathering is going to be open source. You can do anything you want with it. There, there's no license, there's no restrictions. In the aggregate, if we all combine our efforts, we can produce large, full coverage maps of lots of areas. There's some precedent for mapping data being used in a court of law in terms of evidence. The slightly longer term goal is perhaps that it would be used in uh, environmental monitoring and assessment and, and the recovery of the ecologies around here. We'd love to have you come out and map with us, but if you can't make it, we need your support financially as well. The kite costs about 100 bucks. The tank of helium is 50. Balloon is 25. Anything you can put in will help us out in this process. So as you can see, the um, 
the project was funded successfully and they got more than they pledged for. So there was a lot of support for that. Okay. So what is Public Lab today? Uh, four years after, almost four years after. Well, we have now a um, large community of people, collaborators from all walks of life. So we have artists and researchers and scientists, technologists and people from all over the place creating an open community that is contributing um, with their knowledge, their information, their research to create a set of experimental tools. Kite mapping and balloon mapping is one of those tools. And um, there are other tools that I'll just briefly mention. All of those people together create a network of local groups. And, and uh, the more people contribute, the more open data um, there is in the archive. And this creates, of course, um, together free and open source um, data and software that Public Lab has created, so like MapNitter that we're going to use today, but also Spectral Workbench, which is for analyzing spectral data, and also uh, Infragram to analyze near-infrared photography, which is another Public Lab tool. And the, all of those tools, all of that information is in the platform, publiclab.org. So you can go and explore that website. So I won't go into detail, but this, if you go to the tools and techniques page of the public lab, you will see this is just a sample of some of the tools that they have out there. Spectrometer, near-infrared, kite balloon mapping, thermal photography, etc. So today we're going to use mapknitter.org for those of you who want to work online. Otherwise, we're going to simulate uh, what map knitter, so knitting, knitting maps together. We're going to simulate that on paper. And um, this is the test flight that we did yesterday. So if you go to map knitter, you will see when, if you search Perugia, um, the map that we made yesterday, well, one of the photos is on there. So the data for, the data that we collect with the kites and balloons. Also, if, uh, if I'm talking too fast, just let me know if you have questions or anything, just also stop me. I'm just gonna give you a very short presentation of some examples of how this imagery has been used, in what contexts, what it could be used for, and, um, and then we're gonna go on to the actual workshop. So, What's happened to some of the data that's been collected using kites and balloons? Well, since 2012, um, Google Earth Outreach that goes out there to get imagery to use on Google Earth and Google Maps um, found the archive for Public Lab. And they said, well, this, this data is, is really good. It's high resolution. These maps are updated. Um, let's use those because these pictures are in the public domain. So they've um, taken these and made them part of Google Earth. And if, for those of you who are interested and have Google Earth on now on your computers, uh, you can go to, the, um, to this website and download the KML file for Google Earth to see which um, public lab imagery has been used. So this is what it would look like. So you open your Google Earth and you will see little symbols and those are the, the, um, the maps, the public lab maps or maps used using um, public, um, public lab tools using MapNitter. Okay, so let's talk about aerial mapping. So we can do balloon mapping, um, and that is you basically take um, a helium balloon, you fill it up with helium, and you attach a camera, and you send it up. And, or you can use, sorry, let me go back. Or you can use kites, and again, you attach the camera, and you send it up. What do you send up? Well, 
Um, if you were here in the last workshop, you saw you have inexpensive cameras that you attach. The only thing that you need is that the cameras have continuous shooting mode. It's really important because you attach a rubber band to the shooter um, and it, you turn it on and it shoots. Or you can put an SD card that tells your camera what to do, turn on, take pictures every five seconds. And then you attach your camera to a rig, either a plastic bottle or a wooden pick of it like the ones we use today. You can have, come and have a look at one of those after. And we also have, we don't have time, maybe next year, or you can um, look at the Public Lab website, how to make your own kites. So here we have a series of kites. Um, this one is a kite made. I made this myself uh, two years ago in a public lab event in Louisiana. It took us about four hours to make. That is a more recent model. These kites are great because um, the materials, you can find them anywhere, and they, they cost, um, I don't know, less than $12 to make total. And we can talk about those after. You can come have a look at them, etc. So when to use kites, when to use balloons. So if you were out there today getting wet in the first workshop, you probably noticed that all of the flags were like this. So we should have had balloons. But there's a problem with balloons. You have to rent a helium tank and carry it around. And then what do you do with a balloon that's huge? You know, you walk around with it and um, helium is also an endangered gas. But if, um, if you, there is wind, then usually kite works. Also, there are different sizes of kites. Small kites are for fast winds. Bigger kites are for slower winds. The bigger the kite, the more wind it catches, and therefore is yeah, better for when there's less wind. OK, some examples of um, how these maps that people create using aerial photography are being used. So, oops, sorry. So the Guanas Canal, anybody here from the United States? No. OK, so in the United States, in Brooklyn, New York, there is a canal that is severely polluted. Um, the New York chapter in New York of Public Lab has been getting together for about three years. And they've been having an ongoing monitoring program because the Guanas Canal receives about um, a million gallons a day of sewage. Sorry, in liters? Four million liters of sewage um, a day because of overflow. And also there is a problem because many, many years ago, many decades ago, they buried some oil, uh, coal tar, underneath the canal, and that is bubbling up. So kites, what can we do with kites? Well, the group of people in the Guanas Canal created the Guanas Low Altitude Mapping Program. They went out with uh, canoes and balloons, and they wanted to see the sewage overflows and how that directly related to the rain in the sewer system. So here you can see, after Hurricane Sandy, the overflow of sewage. So sewage is the milky water. I don't know if you can see it very well from over there, but that's the sewage, and this is the kite line. They're probably using a balloon. And what else can they see? So I don't know if you can see in these two pictures. You see the milkiness of the sewage. But then you also have an area here that's not milky. So what is that? And people start to find out um, that actually uh, 
there is a spring. The canal is not dead because they thought that because it had been constructed all around that there was no water, natural water flowing into it. So they actually did find it. And now they're starting to use balloons and kites to look at the canal from above and solve these kind of mysteries. Why is it important to know if there's um, a river coming in? Well, that is a good indication that there could be restoration. It could help and support programs for cr creating and protecting the ecosystem around the Guanas Canal. Now, pictures like this, this is directly from Google Maps. So when you zoom in, you're able to see this data is the older data, and this is the new high-resolution data um, mapped by, by the local citizens. So it improves public data, and uh, it replaces state photo. So here's uh, one of the programs I was telling you about. We want to map the old streams and creeks. Can we do that using the maps? From the outside, you'd never think that there is a small stream flowing out of this. But using a kite, you do. Why? Because you can see certain patterns from above that you can't see from the ground. Why is there grass growing in the concrete over there, for example? After you analyze your photos, you've taken your data, you analyze the photos, and you see that there's a pattern of growth of plants. So that's an indication that something is going on. You take your data, and you overlay it onto a map that you have of the area previously, before it got built up and developed. So this is a map from 1766. That data helps you to, will help them um, as a historic map to look at um, where the streams might have been, might have been in the past. And in this particular case, them, because they found a surviving stream, now they're able to negotiate restoration of, of, the, um, of the area, and that was um, a successful case. Just really quickly, another case that they're working on. So in Brooklyn, in 1676, there was a battle, and lots of soldiers died. About over 200 soldiers were buried. This was a very important battle, but there's no historical evidence for this. So they want to find out, well, where are the bodies buried? OK. So with the help of a local historian, they were able to seek Brooklyn's lost mass grave. And they work with the police authorities to, for example, do an investigation of how much space would you need to bury 256 bodies, something like this. And where are the bodies? And how does kite mapping or aerial photography help? Well, past efforts from the 1890s have been excavations where they actually find bodies, but also archaeological sites that haven't been really successful. So the project Over My Dead Body Balloon Mapping happened right here. And they took photos. Um, obviously, that's not <laughs> a dead body. Um, they took photos to see if they could find some patterns, and they found some strange cracks on the ground that was probably an indication, a lead, something, some sort of evidence that they could work on. Without jumping to, to many conclusions, then they used LiDAR 3D topographic model of those pictures, and, um, and they found that there were actually some bumps, this is obviously exaggerated. There are some bumps where they think that these bodies might have been. Okay, so let's look at, that was um, Brooklyn, New York. So let's jump 
all the way to Israel. So, um, in Israel, there is a colleague of mine. Um, her name is Hagit Kesar. Um, it would have been great if she'd been here to give this workshop because kite mapping and balloon mapping is what she does for her research, for her community involvement. And she looks at how imagery using kites and balloons can help start conversations about contested spaces. So Palestinians and Israelis all live in Jerusalem and these spaces are highly contentious. So creating maps can help talk about issues that you can often dismiss and, um, and annotations on maps can help tell those stories that you'd usually not be able to tell. So here we have um, Alam, Ala Salam, who created an aerial map of a contested road that splits his neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood is split into two, and it's environmentally damaging, but it's also, in terms of infrastructure and society, it's also highly divided and contentious. So he created a map stitching together aerial photos. So you can see they probably walked with the kite or the balloon, and they got all of those pictures and they stuck them together. So he presented that aerial map to his MP to start talking about issues that are probably, they were being kept silent for some time. Now, when you create a map from the data that you get, it's like any other picture. Um, aerial photos do not speak for themselves, um, and in particularly those made by communities. Exactly like any other form of photography, aerial images are a ground for interpretation rather than for objective decoding. So what does this mean? Well, um, according to Hagit, the story of communities, contrary to reducing the meaning of an aerial image in the service of a specific interest, um, it's creating a story of a community is one that seeks to reveal social and environmental context through collaborative mapping. So it's not only about the objective reality that you're visualizing in the picture, it's also about seeing the subjective story behind that. But in order for those stories to actually be talked about and appear on a map, the people whose those stories are being told have to be present when the annotation is being made. Okay, so this is um, an aerial image made um, by Hagit of Jerusalem. And she works both with Palestinians and Israelis. And here is an annotated map um, with all of the stories um, behind this map. I won't go into detail as to what all of those are, but you can have a closer look at one of the bits of the map. And it's basically telling you a little bit about what home means and what neighborhood means. So, um, like I said before, uh, in order for people's stories to appear on the map, they actually had to physically stand there besides it and give their voice and give their knowledge, right? And then when this happens, questions that otherwise wouldn't appear, well, perhaps they would, but in this particular case, they did start to arise. It presented the opportunity for people to come out and share this information. So um, the question that arises one, once the aerial photo is created and it's left by itself online or printed offline is, well, who will it reach? Where will this map go? What stories will it tell? Or um, as um, Hagit Kesar put it, 
where do our maps go? So we have um, just a few brief other examples. So a map, sorry, a camera attached to a balloon following a demonstration or uh, forest damage or land use mapping. So here's an example of a parade in Israel as well. You can see the, the line of the map. An iPhone was also attached to a balloon and it took video coverage of 150,000 students in a rally in Chile. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about MapKnitter and I'll um, guide you just very briefly through MapKnitter. So for those of you who are connected to the internet and have your computers, um, if you like to go to MapKnitter.org, the name comes from, as you know, um, knitting means to stitch things together to create, well, a sweater or a scarf or something. So this, pro this uh, online software, that's what it does. It knits together your photos from your aerial imagery. So if you go to mapknitter.org, this is what you'll see. So are some of you connected? Are some of you trying it out? Can I see who's been able to get in there? Just a few people, okay. So if you go there, the first thing you'll see is some examples. So you'll see a video, and then you'll see some examples, and if you scroll down, you'll see the recent map of Perugia. And this is where you wanna be. So you wanna create a new map. And um, the first thing you have to do is sign up. So you create a user account, log in, and then give your map a title, say where you want to make it, and a description, and then the interface looks something like this. So you've named your map, and you zoom in to Perugia, to the area where you recognize that you've mapped, and then you're ready to look at your photos. When you send your camera up, um, depending on the size of the SD card and the life of your batteries, you will probably get somewhere around 800 to 1,200 photos. That is a lot of imagery. So you do spend a lot of time sorting your data rather than um, creating your map. So now I'd like to get you guys working on some data. So for those of you who would like to use your own computers and use some of the data that we collected yesterday, I've got some CDs and some SD cards if you don't have a CD reader. And you can work on your computers, uh, download the imagery, and we'll come to you. Um, so Ted over here is also gonna help out. So there are SD cards as well. And for those of you who don't want to do it online, um, we're gonna be in the middle here. We've printed out some photos and uh, we're gonna create a map. And I've got some materials here that we'll use. And the point is um, that we're gonna create annotations. So we've been here enough days in Perugia to kind of get a feel for um, some of the features. So if um, you've noticed something, you wanna say something about these areas, I'd like you to start creating annotations for those maps. So we've got two sets for two groups and we've got about 29 photos to stitch around and play. Now, um, it's not gonna be as easy as working with Map Knitter because with Map Knitter, which I'll show you in a bit, you can zoom in and zoom out, change the size of your pictures to match the back layer, either Google Maps or OpenStreetMap to use as a guide. So the way it works, you don't geotag your photos, you align them, shift them around um, to features that are on your picture and you match them to the features on Google Maps. 
And um, yeah, so before we break into small groups, I'd like to just ask you if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, you can just come to me if you think they're very specific questions, come to me and we can talk about them. Otherwise, um, we'll split into groups. So any questions so far? No? Okay. So um, who would like to work um, with paper photos? Paper photos? Okay, so if you come to the center with Ted, and if you'd like to do map knitter, put your hand up. It's just a few. So if you're gonna do map knitter, I'd like to invite you to come and sit closer to the front so we can um, talk together.
Okay, yeah, sure. No, you don't you don't have to cut, sorry. You if you want to cut, you can cut. If you or you can just stick them together, glue them together. Yeah. That's better because then if you make a mistake, you can just take it away again. Yeah. So I would suggest you start with two or three pictures and then you build from that. And of course, the 29 pictures you have here, you don't have to use all of them. Some of them are only slightly different. So. Uh, another piece of uh, advice is to actually just eliminate some pictures. You say, oh, this one is very similar to the other one. Let's put it on to the side. Uh, otherwise, it's quite overwhelming. Yep. Another piece of advice is that you look at the pictures that are very uh, straight down. It's better, it's easier to align the ones that are from the top. So for example, this picture is quite good. The Ministry of Transportation you're seeing straight from the top. Uh, I've already eliminated the pictures that are really bad, but some are very angled. So what I just told the other group is some pictures are very straight down. You can see here, for example, this building is almost straight down. Uh, some other pictures, uh, like this one, if you see here, it's angled. So it's easier to work with the ones that are straight down because it's easy to align them up. digital. <laughs> So you see, uh, this is where we were running. No. Yes. <laughs> and you can notice that, um, obviously, this is a picture when the kite is quite low. And then those pictures, uh, the kite is much higher. Because we're still standing in the same place. We didn't move. It just, the, that was when the kite was really high. Unfortunately, you cannot see where you were running because these were taken <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Is there a way to remove the, the, uh, in the picture you take uh, the, uh, the rope? To remove the rope? Uh, yeah, I guess you can. Um, <laughs> but not the uh, manual, of course. Yeah, automatic. I don't know, actually, but you maybe you use, can. You, you you don't use to remove the, the no, because actually when you get very high, it's angled anyway, so you don't see the rope. It's only when it's using balloon mapping and there's no wind, you see the rope. Okay. But with, often with kite mapping, actually none of these pictures have any rope. Yes. 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 It's only the balloon mapping. Yes. Yes. So have you guys selected any pictures that you want to start with? You got any ones that you want to start with? You can use this to um, to glue it. You got this one is obviously the kind of a good. I think this one is a good straight picture from the top. And uh, you see, you want to use.
Yeah, that's good. Let's stick those ones. Let's start with that. Okay, there are, there's more of yeah, that or this one has really far because it has the, the church as well. So it's in there somewhere. If you put that one, maybe it's better. Uh, that's the, yeah, that, that one, yeah. It's easy to put this one on the back. Extend. <laughs> yep. more, more. No, that's passes. about good, yeah. You can always move later, but you know, you see, this is that. Okay. It's yes. not bad. It's not bad. Yes, yes. Okay. And one more there. Of course, this is just a way to show how easy it is to do it online. Because <laughs> yes. if you have to do it with paper, <laughs> it's too much harder. Okay, we can definitely extend more this way. Like, uh, is there a good picture with the full, both of those? That one, yeah. This is not bad. You could take this one. This one has more. Oh, but this one has more grass. Yeah, that's good. You can put this one. One good way to see also is the size of it. The uh, size. Yeah. I think this is not bad, not bad at all. You put that one underneath like that. Actually, put it um, between here. At least this is lining up. <laughs> the one thing um, you can do on the software is you can also change the shape of the picture. So you know you can distort the picture. Mm -hmm. You can drag the corners out. You can make it smaller and bigger. So for example, this one, you see this lines up, but obviously this doesn't. So in the software, you just you would pull the corner and you can make it line up. No, you can, yeah, if you want. You could do that. Um, yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> nice, well done. Yeah. It's because this picture is a very early picture when the kite was going up, yeah. and this one is one when the kite was coming back down. So this is probably taken from an altitude of maybe 80 meters, and this is probably 150 or something. Maybe if it gets cloudy, when maybe it has done this because it, it's more dark. It's darker. Yeah, that's also yeah. You're right. If you are up and the weather changes, or if you're up a very long time, yeah, of course that changes too. But still, it's a good one. You can, you know, you. The point is. It doesn't have to be perfect. You might just want to get an idea of, you know, where other people. There is, I know there are some pictures with the hotel. So you should try and find the hotel where we are now. I know there is, I picked them. Yeah, I'm sure. This yeah, is the hotel. This is the hotel. This is the entrance to the hotel. Yeah. You see, this is the terrace outside. Yeah. Yeah. These are the some cars. That's the Vespa that was standing there yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
This is the hotel. I think there's one more picture with even slightly more. I'm not sure, but maybe. Oh, you actually have it here. It's the same angle. It's the same, okay. Maybe there is one that is better, I don't know. Keep looking, this one, I don't know if this one has more. No, it's the same, isn't it? It's basically the same, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's the best uh, that we have. Ah, look here, a little bit more, just a little bit more. Not much, but slightly more. It's uh, probably not worth it, but it's just a little bit. You can see, you see, for example, this building you don't see in this picture, but it's not a big difference. Yeah, it's not bad. So now what you can do is you can cut away the white parts and try and make it fit together better. When you guys, I'm going to try and find another scissors. You have? No. Okay, I'll try and find it. Ah, do you, um, Miss Lisa, do you have scissors? Do you have scissors like? Uh, I know. No. Do you, can you help me in Italian ask the hotel if yeah. they have? Okay, I found some scissors. Oh, nice. Well done. That looks really good. You, did you find a hotel where we are now? Yeah, you have it, but you cannot see much, but it's here. Yeah, it's where we are. That's the entrance. This is the terrace. Yeah, that's the hotel. Yeah. We are, we are. We are, we are to skate. <laughs> yeah, is that right? Yeah. So we tried to uh, raise a kite on this terrace yesterday, yeah. but it's very difficult if you don't have good wind because, yeah. you know, if it falls on the road and somebody's driving. <laughs> yeah. So if you're in the middle of the buildings, it's better to use a balloon mm -hmm. because it goes straight up and. You yeah, I heard about there's a festival, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, I'd, li I'd like to do that. <laughs> you have the church, yeah, you have the church. Yeah, this is. <laughs> ah, yeah, good. Yeah, perfect. Oh, oh nice. Yeah, Very yeah. nice. Oh, yeah, good. Very good. Thank you. 
feels like being in kindergarten again. Yeah? <laughs> it's fun. Uh, Cindy has done the same thing with uh, uh, children, uh, the age 12 to 16. They're very good at it. Yeah. The, the flying the kite, everything. You done. You have done very well. Very nice. Okay, great stuff. Very good. Yeah, I think both teams have the same kind of pictures. Yeah, pretty much the same. You can uh, take these pictures to the Ministry of Transportation and give us as a gift. <laughs> uh, we've taken a picture of your building. Now we want uh, free parking for the next year. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's why the software is so good because yeah. you actually can, even though a picture was taken at a lower altitude, you can just make it smaller or bigger, yeah. uh, and you can distort the corners. What kind of Yeah, I'll show you the picture. Yeah, I'll show you the camera. Yeah. Just a normal camera like this. Okay. So uh, now it has no SD card in it, but so no memory card at the moment.
the data we're gathering is going to be open source. You can do anything you want with it. There, there's no license, there's no restrictions. In the aggregate, if we all combine our efforts, we can produce large full coverage maps of lots of areas. There's some precedent for mapping data being used in a court of law in terms of evidence. The slightly longer term goal is perhaps that it would be used in uh, environmental monitoring and assessment and, and the recovery of the ecologies around here. We'd love to have you come out and map with us, but if you can't make it, we need your support financially as well. The kite costs about 100 bucks, the tank of helium is 50, balloon is 25. Anything you can put in will help us out in this process. So as you can see, the, um, the project was funded successfully and they got more than they pledged for. So there was a lot of support for that. Okay. So what is Public Lab today, uh, four years after, almost four years after? Well, we have now a large community of people, collaborators from all walks of life. So we have artists and researchers and scientists, technologists and people from all over the place creating an open community that is contributing um, with their knowledge, their information, their research to create a set of experimental tools. Kite mapping and balloon mapping is one of those tools and um, there are other tools that I'll just briefly mention. All of those people together create a network of local groups and and uh, the more people contribute, the more open data um, there is in the archive. And this creates, of course, um, together free and open source um, data and Earth outreach that goes out there to get imagery to use on Google Earth and Google Maps um, found the archive for Public Lab. And they said, well, this. This data is, is really good. It's high resolution. These maps are updated. Um, let's use those because these pictures are in the public domain. So they've um, taken these and made them part of Google Earth. And if, for those of you who are interested in have Google Earth on now on your computers, uh, you can go to the um, to this website and download the KML file for Google Earth to see which um, public lab imagery has been used. So this is what it would look like. So you open your Google Earth and you will see little symbols and those are the, the, um, the maps, the public lab maps or maps used using um, public, um, public lab tools using MapNitter. Okay, so let's talk about aerial mapping. So we can do balloon mapping, um, and that is you basically take um, a helium balloon, you fill it up with helium, and you attach a camera, and you send it up. And, or you can use, sorry, let me go back. Or you can use kites, and again, you attach the camera, and you send it up. What do you send up? Well, um, if you were here in the last workshop, you saw you have inexpensive cameras that you attach. The only thing that you need is that the cameras have continuous shooting mode. It's really important because you attach a rubber band. So I'm going to show you um, a short video um, that was made for the Kickstarter campaign with the BP oil spill. So this is how Public Lab started. A group of people got together that lived in Louisiana um, in the area where uh, the BP oil spill affected the wetlands and the fisheries around there. And this was a call for people to come out and help, to come and volunteer, to get 
data to get the damage of the spill on the map, literally, because nobody, um, well, it was being left out of the media, it was being left out of um, stories uh, in general. So this is um, an effort, and this is the video. There's increasingly kind of a media blackout of the spill. It's tough to actually see what's going on. The message here is that anyone can get out on the beaches and to areas that have been affected and, and map the oil spill. Yeah, see? Like if, if you just hold it from here, then it tends to hold a shape better. The idea is to get a lot of people involved in producing maps and then to share all the information, like Wikipedia style, you know? All you need is a kite or a balloon. You need a, a camera, a lot of string, have the camera taking pictures every five seconds. And software that Public Lab has created, so like MapNitter that we're gonna use today, but also Spectral Workbench, which is for analyzing spectral data, and also uh, Infragram to analyze near-infrared photography, which is another Public Lab tool. And the, all of those tools, all of that information is in the platform, publiclab.org, so you can go and explore that website. So I won't go into detail, but this, if you go to the tools and techniques page of the public lab, you will see this is just a sample of some of the tools that they have out there. Spectrometer, near infrared, kite balloon mapping, thermal photography, etc. So today we're going to use mapknitter.org for those of you who want to work online. Otherwise we're gonna simulate uh, what map knitter, so knitting, knitting maps together. We're gonna simulate that on paper. And um, this is the test flight that we did yesterday. So if you go to map knitter, you will see when, if you search Perugia, um, the map that we made yesterday, well, one of the photos is on there. So the data for, the data that we collect with the kites and balloons. Also, if, uh, if I'm talking too fast, just let me know if you have questions or anything, just also stop me. I'm just gonna give you a very short presentation of some examples of how this imagery has been used, in what contexts, what it could be used for, and, um, and then we're gonna go on to the actual workshop. So, What's happened to some of the data that's been collected using kites and balloons? Well, since 2012, um, Google um, do-it-yourself aerial mapping part two. Um, thank you for those of you who endured the rain during the first part of the aerial mapping. Uh, my name is Cindy and I'm a community organizer for Public Laboratory for Open Technology and Science, and it's a great pleasure to be here and have been invited to be part of this festival. Hopefully, we can share some information that is useful for you. So what I'm gonna share with you is one of the public lab tools, which is mapping using kites. In the morning, like I said, we did, we tried anyway, to do a little bit of mapping. There wasn't enough wind, but um, this second part of the workshop is dedicated to actually playing with the data. So we did have a backup plan and we have some uh, photos from when we went mapping yesterday that we're gonna use uh, in one of the tools, but we'll get to that. So um, the space that is cleared on the ground here is for you to come and sit down on the floor. We actually got someone to sweep the floor, so it's clean, don't worry. And uh, we have some pictures printed out in color and we're gonna stitch a map together. But if you don't want to do paper-based mapping, then we're gonna use the public lab tool online called Map Knitter. But first things first, so um, let's talk about public lab. And the best way to talk about public lab is to let public lab talk. So I don't know if I, how can, how can I get good sound? Is there a way to get the sound? Maybe this? 